Heavenly Father, who in mercy sent your only begotten Son into this world so that we should live through him. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts this morning so that through the preaching of your word we might be strengthened, forgiven, and comforted in the mercy that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. And filled with your mercy might show the same towards others in our lives and in our words as we walk the way to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We we'll begin with our first hymn, which is a children's hymn again this week. Hymn 861 in the Lutheran service book, Christ Be My Lord. unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of a holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. And grant that we ask that grant that what we ask in faith we may obtain through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. reading is from Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. This is, of course, long after uh, the terrible things that Joseph's brothers had done to him when they sold him into slavery. And Joseph's response to that. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when he spoke to him, when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, 
to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7 responsively. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is broken. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Our epistle reading is from Romans 14, verses 5 through 9. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats eats in honor of the Lord, since he give th gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please arise for the gospel reading. Alleluia. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, with his wife and children and all he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe! So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. We confess our faith in the words
words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 755 in the Lutheran service book, in the very midst of life.
We pray. Lord, sanctify us through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dearly beloved, to whom Christ has shown mercy, grace, and peace to you. What is your limit? How many times will you forgive? Peter's answer to that question was seven. And he thought that was a lot. See, the teachers of his day said that three times was all you had to forgive someone. And so Peter figures seven, well, that's, that's more than twice. Three. After that, surely you've forgiven enough. What about us? Do we have a limit? Far too often, don't we really think of the limit as being kind of just, just one time? You know, you've probably heard people say, oh, everybody gets one. Or you hear people say, everybody gets a, deserves a second chance. There's a couple of problems with that phrase. First is that it suggests that people should really only be forgiven once. They get the second chance, but not a third or a fourth most of the time. And the other is that little word, deserves. Everybody deserves a second chance. It gets right to the part of the problem that we have with forgiveness and mercy. And that is that, that we think of it like economics. Like a system of debts and credits of things earned and deserved. See, isn't it true that if there's any limit at all, then the limit is really none? If there's any point at which we would stop forgiving someone, doesn't that mean that we've never understood forgiveness to begin with? How many times would you forgive someone for doing the same thing to you? Husband or wife that cheated on you? Somebody that robbed from you? Or killed someone that you loved? How many times? A child that Talk back to you the same way, the same day, over and over and over. How many times would you forgive them before you blew up, before you got too annoyed? Maybe you think you've forgiven someone, but have you really? There's a limit on your forgiveness. Your forgiveness is really none. If you think you've forgiven someone, but you're less likely to forgive them for the same thing again next time, you didn't really forgive them at all. If you think you've forgiven someone, but you kind of think that ever after that, you've got the power in that relationship. Like, you're the bigger person. They owe you. And you haven't really forgiven them at all. What is the point and power of forgiveness? When I was Googling images for the bulletin cover about forgiveness, there was all kinds of pictures that had quotes about forgiveness. And people have a lot to say about forgiveness. And I'd say at least half of them had something to do with how forgiveness isn't about the other person, it's about you. It's about your own mental health. It's about your own empowerment. It's about moving on with your life. It's not for them, it's for you. That's what these things said. But the point of forgiveness is you, and the power of forgiveness must also be you. And if the point and power of forgiveness is you, then forgiveness has no point and no power at all. I was reading a book once. There was a character in this book who, when he was younger, had uh, made a big mistake. He'd been caught up with some bad people, and he'd shot a man and killed him. The uh, lawman, kind of like the police officer in the area, had had mercy on this boy. And instead of punishing him, he had taken him along with him and trained him. He became sort of his sidekick. He became a very good man. But he could never forget what he had done. And every year he would go to the family of that man he had killed, to that man's children and that man's wife, and he would bring them most of the money he had earned that year. And every year that family would say to him, this doesn't mean we forgive you. And every year he would say, I know. If you ask the world, if you polled people and asked, should that family forgive that man, what do you think they would say? I think you'd get, I think you'd get a few answers, basically one of three. 
Some people would say, no, they shouldn't. You, no matter what he does, it can't make up for the fact that that man is gone. Other people would say, well, everybody deserves a second chance, and look at all the good that this man has done. He really deserves for them to forgive him. And other people would say, well, they should forgive him for themselves, just to move on so they don't hold that grudge anymore. Did you notice? I can't think, I can't think of any other thing that people in this world would say besides one of those three things. And all three of those things have nothing to do with forgiveness. All three of them have to do with debts and credits and things earned and deserved. None of them has to do with mercy. The character in the parable that Jesus tells has wrapped up quite a debt. It is insane how much his debt is. According to one commentator that I read, one talent was worth about 20 years' wages for your common worker of the day. If we translated that into our own economic terms, consider a uh, kind of average blue-collar worker maybe making about $40,000 a year. Multiply that by 20, and you're talking about $800,000, the approximate value of one pound. Can you imagine being $800,000 in debt to someone? They talk about how you know, the massive student loan debts that, like, for instance, a doctor might have coming out of school. And even though they make a really good salary, it takes them quite a while to pay that off. It's two to $300,000. This is $800,000. And $800,000 is just one talent. This man owes 10,000 talents. That's the equivalent of about $8 trillion. Can you imagine what that debt would be like? Can you imagine what the interest accrued on such a debt would be? Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates combined could not even put a debt into that, sorry, a dent into that debt. I don't think that all of their net worth combined could even pay off the interest accrued on $8 trillion of debt in one year. How did anybody even get such a debt? It's astonishing. It's supposed to be astonishing. And it makes the man's claim ridiculous. When he says to the master, have patience with me and I will pay you everything, that is literally ludicrous. Not with 10,000 lifetimes could you pay off such a debt. And so the master does not give him what he asks. He does not say, yeah, have some time and pay it off. Instead, he, out of mercy, forgives the debt. Think about what that means for this man. Before his life and all he had was forfeit. He owned nothing but debt. And now the master, the king, has replaced all that debt with nothing but mercy. Think how that would make you feel. Imagine something even, even far smaller. Somebody called you up and, and told you that the mortgage on your house had been paid off in whole by some anonymous stranger. How would you feel? Would you go jumping and running around like that guy from the old Disney movie with a little bluebird on his shoulder singing zippity doo dah? Wouldn't you go home and celebrate with your family? Wouldn't you just be filled with good cheer towards everyone? You'd think so. This, of course, is exactly what has happened to you. Far more than a mortgage, far more than $8 trillion of debt. The first part of this parable is perfectly picturing the gospel. Every one of us stands before God with a list of debt so massive, it's impossible to imagine. Eight trillion dollars doesn't even come close. Because every one of your sins and mine brings with it an eternal debt. Each sin we commit brings that sentence. Each word that you speak carelessly, every time you roll your eye or snap off a rude comment because you're annoyed with somebody, Every time that you fail to forgive someone, every time you hold a grudge, every time that you're so quick to excuse your own actions and so slow 
to understand someone else's. Every time you're convicted of some sin, you're right away, you go, yeah, well, he started it, or yeah, well, she did this. And then on top of that, when we try to make up for our sins, we actually make it worse. Uh, Martin Luther, in his Heidelberg Disputation, wrote, The works of the righteous would be mortal sins if they would not be feared as mortal sins by the righteous themselves out of pious fear of God. What he's saying is that the very best things you do, the good works you do, unless when you are doing them, you fear that they are sinful. They damn you. And he's right. Every time we think that anything we are doing is good enough for God, we are actually adding to our debt. Which means that every time we would try to pay it off, if we would ever say, well, have pity on me, I'll pay you everything, we're actually making it worse. Because if we think that we can do something in order to get, you know, some of, some of our debt whittled down, we obviously think an awful lot of how good that work is. We think it's good enough to make a payment to God. It'd be like if you, you know, you had your mortgage on your house, and every month when you send in your payment, instead of lowering what you owed, it added to what you owed instead. What a hopeless situation! What a plight each one of us is in! That we owe this debt to God we couldn't possibly pay, and every time we try, we only make it worse. That is our state before God, our King. We owe nothing before Him but debt and sin and wretchedness. And then, God freely forgives us. He does this for no other reason than His own pity. And mercy towards us. He doesn't say, okay, I'll give you more time and see if you can pay it off. He doesn't say, oh yeah, you, you'll go to purgatory for 10 million years and burn those sins off for a while. There's no such place as purgatory. He doesn't make any conditions. Instead, out of pity, he releases you, forgives you, pardons you. He looks at you in your wretched state, helpless sinners who can offer him nothing, and he removes that great debt of sin by taking it onto himself. I mean, that's implied in the parable, right? As, as insane as it is to imagine that somebody owed such a debt, think about what that means on the other side. If he owed the master that much, that means that if the master doesn't get it, he's out that much. Who could afford to take such a loss? There isn't a man on earth, there isn't a government on earth that could take such a loss and not be destroyed by it. Only God could do that. And that's what he has done. He took the loss. Our sins weren't just swept under the rug, they were paid for. Someone paid for that mercy. And that someone was God, who sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh. He was incarnate in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He comes in humility, taking the form of a servant. He takes upon himself the hopeless load of your sins, all our wicked thoughts, all our failures to forgive, all our arrogant attempts to be good enough. He takes to the cross, and there he makes payment. He becomes the atoning sacrifice. That means the sacrifice that makes you at one with God. Before, your debt, your sin separated you from him, and now you are one with him through Jesus Christ. He has redeemed you. And he could do this because he was true God and true man. As great as the weight of your sins and the sins of the world was, greater still is the weight of of the precious blood of the eternal Son of God. It avails before God. That means it's enough, and it is more than enough. His righteousness is greater than your sin. His innocence is deeper than your wickedness. His mercy is far more vast than all your debt. And this pity, this mercy, now is your entire life. Before, you owned nothing but debt, now, you own nothing but mercy. Everything you have, you have by his mercy alone. And that's all you really have. 
You can't lay claim to anything. You can't say, I deserve anything. But you can lay claim to mercy. Because you, by faith, can lay claim to Jesus Christ, your Savior. He is mine because he has given himself to me. And he is mercy. Now think of what that means. And go back to that story, to that scene, right after the man leaves the throne room of the king, right after he's been forgiven. We talked about how you would expect him to be in this delirious state of joy like Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas Day. But that's not what you find in the parable. Instead, the story takes a repulsive and shocking turn. It says that he goes out, and the very first thing he does is to find a fellow servant who owes him 100 denarii. Uh, I've read different things from different commentators on how much that is. Some say it's like 20 bucks. Some say it's more like a couple of months' wages. Either way, it is far less, laughably less, than what this man had previously owed. Yet, the servant goes, and he grabs this man around the throat. He chokes him, and he screams in his face, Pay me what you owe! Isn't there, isn't there a song? Pay me what you owe me? Don't think I forgot? Came out a few years ago. Isn't that exactly the way our world operates? We get so obsessed with what other people owe to us. When this man does that, the other servant falls down and he pleads with him. He says, give me time and I'll pay you. And in, and in his case, that's actually a reasonable request. You give the guy some time and he would be able to pay that most likely. But instead, the wicked servant throws him into prison. Which just makes no sense. It's wicked and heartless. A nearly unfathomable level of cruelty and malice. See, the only... The only driving factor for such an action is hatred. You're not going to get your money out of somebody by throwing them in jail. I always thought it was ridiculous when you read about, you know, a long time ago, some people will say, yeah, didn't you know that Georgia was settled by criminals? Or that Australia was settled by criminals? Well, the criminals largely were just people who owed money that they couldn't pay. They used to take people who couldn't pay off debts and put them in jail. And so their jails were overcrowded. What a stupid thing to do. What kind of sense does that even make? These aren't dangerous people. And putting them in jail doesn't help anyone. It's just, it's just retribution. It's just hatred. And that's what this servant shows. And that's really what holding grudges is like, too. It's not for my good, and it's not for their good. It's only from hatred. The other reason this doesn't make any sense is the context. You know, if, you, if, if the only part of the story that you knew was that this servant owed the other servant 100 denarii, and he couldn't pay, and so this servant, the wicked servant, had another, another servant thrown into jail, you might not like that wicked servant, but he might not appear to be that horrible of a person. You might think, well, he, he overreacted, but the guy did owe him some money. It's when you zoom out, it's when you include the context of where he's just come from, that you're repulsed by his actions. Because he's just been forgiven such a massive debt. Because the only reason that his wife and children and himself are not now slaves, the only reason that his life is not finished and over and done completely, is the mercy of that king. And then he goes out and he does that? The scene is repulsive. It makes us cringe away. It makes us scream out, who would do such a thing? And then Jesus turns to you and he points the finger at you and he says, you would. And you have. That's the point. That's the law that Jesus is directing at you and me. You are the wicked servant. Every time that you do not forgive, every time you demand retribution, every time you put somebody in the doghouse, every time you harbor resentment and hatred, every time you, you want to make sure somebody else makes up for what they did first before you'll forgive them, you are the wicked servant. When you do that, you are acting as if people owe you. But how can anyone owe you anything? Think of the servant. Before he was forgiven, he didn't own anything but debt, right? The debt that the other servant owed him, if he could have collected it, 
would have been given right away to the king. It would be kind of like if uh, Hannah, Debbie, and Michael are standing around. And Hannah says, Debbie, do you have that $100 that I lent you? And Debbie says, oh, I still got it. And then Michael says, oh, Debbie, here's that 20 bucks I borrowed from you. Hannah's going to reach over and say, thank you very much. Now you only owe me 80. Right? Now, if it was true when that servant owed so much to his master, when he owned nothing but debt, that whatever was owed to him was really owed to the master, how much more true isn't it that when he owns nothing but mercy, no one owes him anything at all? How much more shouldn't he have forgiven the debt that was owed to him? That this is the economy of the kingdom of heaven. Not debts, not things earned and deserved, but mercy. We could call it trickle-down mercy. God has mercy on you. He pours out his forgiveness, and that fills us with mercy to pour out to others. If we own nothing but mercy, then it is impossible for anyone to owe us anything at all. Every moment, every scene of your life is in this context where you have just come from the throne of God the King and He has forgiven you freely this massive debt. At every moment, this is how you live. How can we hold someone's sins against them when God has not held ours against us? It is undoubtedly the case that you have sinned far more against God than anyone else has sinned against you. If you get tired of forgiving someone for doing the same thing over and over, reframe the situation. Remember that you have sinned against God in the same ways, far more than seven times, far more than 70 times, seven times, and he freely forgives you. He doesn't get tired of it. If you begin to feel superior to others because you're like, I've forgiven you, and now I am your Lord, and you owe me, take a pin to your pride by remembering where you've, been, where you've just come from, how much you've been forgiven by God. This is the point and the power of forgiveness. This is what it's about. It's about the mercy of God in Christ. That's the only reason for our forgiveness. It's the only reason for our very life and our existence. It is his mercy then which stands between you and everyone else in the world. His mercy which stands between you and your brother, your sister, your friend, your neighbor. The law is terrifying here. You must have mercy. You must forgive or you will not be forgiven. It's supposed to be terrible. It's supposed to disabuse you and I of the notion that we are good. That we have been merciful. It's supposed to disabuse us of the notion that we could ever pay back what we owe. But the gospel is beautiful. That every debt, every sin has been forgiven by God. And even, even that wickedness of the servant in the text, which we find in our own hearts and lives, is forgiven by God's great mercy. Because this mercy is everything. It fills all. It clears away the hatred and selfishness and stubbornness of our hearts. It removes all debts, removes all bitterness, removes all except Christ. For Christ is mercy. Where he is king, mercy reigns. In him you own nothing but mercy. And so you are owed nothing at all. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please arise and we'll sing the offertory.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy in Jesus Christ. And we ask you throughout our lives to remind us of this great mercy and grace that you have shown to us in forgiving us our sins, so that we, being filled with your mercy, might have mercy on others. That you would warm our cold and deadened hearts by your grace, so that we would forgive as we have been forgiven, so that we would live in tenderness and compassion with all, not holding their sins against them, but forgiving freely as you have freely forgiven us. We ask, Lord, that by this mercy, and, and by the message of this mercy, you would bring many to believe in you, both in this and in other lands. Bless the pastors and missionaries and teachers and lay people of our congregations and our synod, and the synods in fellowship with us in other lands. And bless all people around the world, all your holy Christian church, Lord, with this gospel, that many might believe and be strengthened in this faith. Bless, Lord, the governments of our world. Give them understanding and wisdom and fairness and justice. And bless the citizens in our communities and country with joy and love to serve you and to serve one another. Bless those who serve us in this land in various roles, such as doctors, nurses, and firefighters, and police officers and teachers. Give them steadfastness and love and patience for the work that you have given. And help us to have appreciation for what they do, to live in thanksgiving to you for them. Lord, bless all those who are sick, give them healing. Those who are lonely, comfort them with your presence. Those who are doubting, give them the confidence of your word. Those who are guilty, give them the, the joy of forgiveness. Lord, bless especially those that we have been asked to remember. Bless the Casper family. Give them a comfort in, in, in a difficult time when they are when they are stuck at home. Bless Chad with healing. We thank you, Lord, that at least thus far he hasn't had any real symptoms. Bless um, the shut-ins in our congregation, Gloria, Longwitz, Joanne Johannes, John and Deanna Herzberg, Harold and Carol Gilbertson, Dan and Chris Holman. Bless all those who are lonely. Bless Lord Don Bickham, Kaylee Newey, Missionary Todd Holman, and Desiree Now. Bless these and all others that we remember before you, Lord. Bless all those who are in need of your mercy and grace and help us to show that to them, what we say, what we do. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. We'll continue with the service of the sacrament on page 9 in your bulletin. Please arise. The Lord be with you. give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You have your communion packets. Don't open them, but hand them on in. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Now may this, the true body and true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true Christian faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Depart in peace. Continue with the note of this. your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
mercy and forgiveness to each of you. Um, a few announcements. I'm on vacation this next week, but I'm going to be in town. So I'm still available for things. I'm going to move in tomorrow, so I'm going to be doing stuff like that. Um, there's still going to be church Wednesday night. This Wednesday. It'll be the same as this service, obviously. Next Wednesday, there won't be. Because on Sunday, uh, my dad's going to be the guest preacher. So he's not going to be here Wednesday, too. So there will be church Wednesday while I'm on vacation this week, but there won't be the following Wednesday. I'll remind people of that on Sunday. Um, there will be confirmation class. I'll deal with the people that too. Both Wednesdays, though. As long as they're also available. Let's see. Um, I don't know if there are any other announcements. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with each of you. Oh, of course, uh, private study on Facebook coming shortly ish.